All right, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for bearing with us. New venue, new everything. So, you know, it's just a bunch of delays, delays, false starts, things like that. But hey, I appreciate you coming out over here. So uh, this is called, as you can see on just the one screen, Travel Better, Expedient Digital Defense. So I am Gray Fox. Um, my background is uh, retired Air Force. I did basically intelligence for 20 years. A lot of that intelligence, though, involved some kind of either defensive or offensive cyber. It also involved briefing a lot of people on how they can operate in environments where foreign intelligence services were after them. So I created this briefing for them. It is, it is typically long, but we only have about a half hour with me. So we'll do our best over here. I uh, do a bunch of digital forensics on the side. I do product security and pen testing, not so much on the side. I um, really am into wireless stuff. My, uh, my big obsessions right now are setting up Wi-Fi networks and then trying to break them. Wi-Fi is getting better, so I'm probably getting worse. So I got to keep up with the times on that one. Um, for my hobbies, I ruck march. I put on heavy weight and I walk around because, hey, who needs joints, right? You know, but I don't do it on sand. I'm sick of sand. I don't want to see sand ever again. Welcome to Las Vegas, right? So just to give you an idea of what we're getting into, just foundations. If you were coming in here expecting something very comprehensive, I unfortunately can't give that. But what I'm hoping to leave you with is just a flavor of what you can do to get a little bit deeper into things like wireless anti-tracking, trying to reduce your attack surface when you're traveling, and some things that you can do to mitigate uh, whatever dangers that or exploitation that could be posed to you if you happen to lose your device or it gets stolen or you get pulled in by security and they take your devices and they try to get information about you off of them. These things happen. Ask me how I know. Um, I'm going to give you some of those tips and some of those tools. What we're really looking for, though, is a mindset. I'm not trying to sell you anything. It's just about how to think a little bit more like the adversary when you're out and about, when you're in places where your information may be exposed. What we're not going to do is cover the entire thing that I like to cover. I typically do this for military members for 90 minutes. You're getting, I don't know, we'll see, maybe 20-ish minutes now. So I might go fast. If I do go fast, my contact information is going to be at the end. Please hit me up. Please hit me up. I will answer your questions. I'll give you all the time that you deserve. So, biggest thing, if you take away nothing else from this talk, is threat modeling. You have your attack surface. That's everything that you use. It is your phone, your computer, your social media presence, your wireless presence, anything like that. And then you have your threat profile. Those are the people that are after you. Those are anybody that can benefit from getting your information. If I am going to attack your attack surface, it's because I want something that you have. I am part of your threat profile. It's different for everybody. A school teacher has a different threat profile than a school student. A computer user at home has a much different threat profile than someone that's a computer user at an airport. So that's something that you need to square away with is what is your attack surface? What does it look like? What do you use? And then who's after it? This all comes down to the operation security process. And this is something that we should all be living with. Operation security or OPSEC is a cycle. You identify what your vulnerabilities are, your attack surface. You identify who's after it, your threat profile. You look at what would happen if they exploited that vulnerability. And then you do your risk analysis. Not every vulnerability needs to be patched. Some of them carry a really low risk. I use a cell phone. Cell phones are full of vulnerabilities. If I stopped using a cell phone, am I safe? Well, maybe, maybe not. But you, use, you completely lose the benefit of using a cell phone. So you're not going to stop using your cell phone, right? You're going to accept that risk. When you accept that risk, then you need to think about, well, what if the adversary did exploit me? How could I mitigate some of the worst issues of losing my cell phone or getting it compromised? And then you put mitigations in place. You put defenses in place. Maybe you change the way you use it a little bit. That's the OPSEC process. But the important thing is, it's a mindset. It's something that you constantly do. It's going to become second nature after a while. Everything that you do, you're going to think about it. What risk does this pose? How does it increase or decrease my attack surface? How does it change my threat model? So let's start off. These are things that you can do without traveling. You could be sitting in your home 
and you can do these things and it'll still reduce your attack surface. This audience, I don't have to explain to you what MFA is, password managers, I don't need to go through that. You all already know what this is. It's been shoved down your throats so many times over the past decade. Long, complicated passwords. Use a password manager. Multi-factor authentication is going to stop a lot of these attacks. If you can use a pin or a password, definitely use it. If for some reason you happen to be traveling and you lose your phone, you lose your computer, some applications allow you to have a standalone pin or password that you use to activate or to access that app, even if it's still on your device and your device is unlocked, it's a good second layer of defense. I would definitely recommend that. Backups are a good thing that a lot of people don't think about. If your devices are lost, stolen, or confiscated, and you need to recover, you can recover. My favorite way to back things up is putting it on a thumb drive, leaving it somewhere, like in my house, somewhere where I can access it, copying a second thumb drive, maybe leaving it in my car, and if I really want overkill, I maybe back up stuff to a third thumb drive and I leave it at a friend's or a relative's house. Because what if my car gets broken into? What if my house burns down? I still have that third backup. You'll probably be thinking about other things than re-imaging your computer or phone if your house burns down, but it's still some peace of mind. One less thing you need to worry about. And then the last thing is end-to-end -end encrypted chat and calling. This reduces your attack surface a lot. And I would normally spend three slides talking to people about how to choose one. Are you going to choose WhatsApp? Are you going to use Signal, Wire, Telegram? What is it going to be? I'm not going to sell you any apps. I'm not going to give you recommendations. For all I know, Signal protocol gets broken tomorrow. And I don't want you going home thinking, oh, man, Gray Fox told me to use Signal. What a jerk. So I'm not going to do that. But what I will say is work with your ecosystem. If you're in an environment where everyone else is using WhatsApp, use WhatsApp because app fatigue is a thing. Don't try to get everyone to go with what you use. It's an uphill battle and you're probably gonna lose that battle. Really what you wanna have in mind is thinking like the adversary, using your OPSEC. Every keystroke, there is a potential for every keystroke to be exposed. You could be using the most secure thing in the entire world, but what if there's malware on your device that gets around the encryption? So just think about it before you type it, before you say it. Blinky boxes are great, but the technology is not going to save you. Your brain is going to save you. Social media is another one. Um, we're getting away from what you carry and now into what your presence looks like. If I'm the adversary and I want to build an intelligence dossier on you, damn sure I'm going to go to your LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Instagram, wherever you have a presence, I'm going to find you and I'm going to put it together. Every photograph that you post, I'm not only going to look at your face, I'm going to look at who you're standing next to. I'm going to look at what's in the background. I'm going to look at the date time group and I'm going to put together a pattern of life and a pattern of movement and a pattern of communication. All of these things I can get from your social media. And the more that I can get as an adversary about how you live and how you travel, the better I can determine if I were foreign intelligence where I can possibly sit next to you and try to solicit you, get information from you, maybe even try to turn you to my side. It's really nuanced, really, really nuanced, but definitely go and take a look at what your social media presence looks like. See if you were investigating yourself, what could you put together? It's pretty eye-opening. I'm not saying get rid of your Facebook account. You don't have to do that, but I'm just saying use it a little bit better. This is when you start getting into open source intelligence. If you really want to see what your internet footprint looks like, use some of these resources, see what's out there. These are all accessible to me. I can get you from these. If you can get yourself from these, great. Even if you can't get rid of that information and deleting your data off the internet is extremely hard. It's really time consuming. It may be like, it may be a Sisyphean task because whether you delete it in one place or not, it'll appear in another place. It's like playing whack-a-mole, but at least you're aware that it's out there. And if you know that it's out there, you can put other mitigations in place. You can maybe alter some of your routines, maybe stop using an app, maybe think a little bit more about whether you tag something, giving your location out, stuff like that. It's an extremely useful exercise to think like the enemy and see what you can find on you. Now let's talk about phones. I hate phones. I hate them. I hate them because I absolutely need it. And it always, always tries to bite me, always. You have so many radio genes on a typical phone that there's no way to tamp it down. But there are some things that you can do to try to mitigate the risk. All of the signals that your phone is going to put out is collected by the operating system. 
it's collected by whatever's providing you internet access. Every single application is trying to access all the way down to the kernel level, all the inner workings of your device. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, anything. If you're connected to something, it wants your location. If I'm the adversary, getting your emails, fine. Getting your communications are good. I got some content and photos, great. I might even get some file access. But if I get your location, if I know where you are, that's my bread and butter. Because then I know where I can find you, I know who you're meeting with, and I know for how long, and I'm developing that pattern of life. Foreign intelligence security services, FIS, they're the ones that are typically after my clients, foreign uh, military members. You can't really do much if you just track them online. What's, what's the end point? The end point is to try to solicit them in person. This is a means to an end. I can't do that without location. That's when I start getting into wireless anti-tracking. If I can try to tamp down how much my phone is giving out my location, then that's what I'm going to go for. The reason why location is so dangerous is because it is the business model for your device. So the way that advertising works is you use an application for free. It's got to get paid for somehow. And so it follows this cycle. The organization that made your app is collecting your data. It's selling it to a data broker. Data broker sells that to advertisers. Advertisers send you advertisements and every click is going to be more money. It's a cycle, but it's innocuous. They're not the enemy. They're not trying to go after you. But the problem is when you're making money from advertising, you're not making any money from security. So that's why this is so bad. They're not trying to get after you, but if somebody breaches those data and all of your collected information is out there, your location is out there. And I, as the adversary, can buy it or I can steal it or I could just go open source and I could find it somewhere for free anyway. So that's why it's a gold mine for someone like me. That's why your phones are so dangerous. It's all about the location. It's all about the advertising system. Can you get around it? Yeah, you can mitigate a lot of this and we'll start getting into that. Smart cities are becoming more and more prevalent. UTS or ubiquitous technical surveillance is a reality. If you live in the United States, you're seeing these things pop up more and more. If you live overseas, it's already what you live in. You have cameras everywhere with facial recognition um, as, as your edge computing. So it doesn't really matter one way or another if you have a mainframe or something like that that has all your faces in it. These cameras can automatically use algorithms to detect your face. It's instantaneous. ShotSpotter is a neat technology that takes audio from surrounding areas and it tries to correlate that audio with gunshots and then it alerts law enforcement. So you have video and you have sound. You have tag readers, license plate readers all over the place that'll read where your vehicle is going. You also have point of sale systems. If any of you use touchless payment with your phone, that's being collected as well. All of these things ostensibly are being collected anonymously but in order for them to work with the uh, vast amount of collection that they need to do, there's not a lot of overhead for security. So once again, just like the advertising system, you're looking at something that is breachable. You're looking at anonymous data that can be easily de-anonymized. So ubiquitous technical surveillance in a smart city is going to be the enemy in this case. It doesn't want to be your enemy. It wants to do good. It wants to alert a fire department when there's a fire. But as an adversary, you can weaponize these data. So how do you get around it? If you want to take a picture of this slide, go for it, because I'm not going to explain everything. We don't have the time for that. But there are simple things that you can do to mitigate. The biggest thing you can do is turning off some of those radio chains on your devices, specifically Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Wireless sensors are everywhere. If you don't put out a wireless signal, I won't be able to get you. It's not 100%, but it comes close. Uh, same thing with your web browsers. If you use an ad blocker or if you put on strict cookie protection, you should be okay. There's recent news that Firefox was kind of lying and not really blocking your third-party cookies. You can go into your custom settings in Firefox and you can customize blocking cookies. I think that kind of goes around that just overall strict problem, but I would recommend something like uBlock Origin, you know, for the time that it still works. It's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty good add-on that I think does the job of uh, getting rid of a lot of those cookies, especially the ones that collect location data. When you're looking at payment systems, cash is still king. If you pay with cash, you're good. There is a camera that sees your face. There's probably audio that'll recognize your voice, but at least what you're paying and what you're, uh, what you're buying 
might still be a little bit of a secret, at least for now. And then lastly, if you're looking at your cars, it's difficult. If you want a good car, it's going to be connected. It'll have many radio chains. But do yourself a favor. Try to refrain from connecting your phone to your car because the car is not just accessing your music. It's not just accessing apps and stuff like that you know, for navigation. It's also accessing usernames, contacts, call history, SMS history. And cars, the security are not great in a car. So if I were to hack into a car, I basically have what is also on your phone especially when you're renting a car. Think about that. Think about the wireless implications of tethering a device. So we can get into that. We can spend an hour. I don't have an hour. I wish I did. So now let's get into a little bit more physical security stuff. When you're going through any security checkpoints, I'm talking about airports, rail, whatever, turn your devices off completely cold. Even with the best forensics equipment, something that is turned off, what we call a cold state, would be extremely hard to get into, especially if it's a modern, uh, a modern operating system. Android 13-ish and up, the latest iOS, they, um, they all use file-based encryption, which forensically is a lot harder than full disk encryption. If you have your device turned off, I as an adversary would have a hard time getting into that device. If I only have you for 20 minutes in secondary at an airport, that's not enough time to crack anything. If your device is locked but it's turned on, we call that a warm state, Depending on the operating system and the version, maybe I can brute force your PIN. If you use a six-digit PIN or higher, that would take too long. If you have your phone on and unlocked, well then, physical possession is, is always going to be the king and queen here. So if you don't have it locked, that's on you. I got everything. So do yourself a favor, turn it off. If you have it on your person and not in a bag, that's a bonus. Most places, when they pull you into secondary, they're not going to search your body. They may search your bags. So do yourself a favor. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, and this is a little bit more advanced, if you're worried about your phone or your computer being compromised and you have sensitive stuff in a chat app or over email, uninstall that app before you go through the security checkpoint because then there's no evidence that it was there unless they do a full forensic rip. And if that's the case, you probably have bigger problems than what the content was. But that's just something a lot of people don't really take into account. You're not going to lose all your data if you uninstall the app. When you're finished, you get everything back, you reinstall it, you're okay. But just keep those little tidbits in mind. Security checkpoints, they're a minefield. Ask me how I know. I would also avoid doing any dummy devices because eventually they'll look at your phone that's a dummy phone and be like, oh, there's nothing on here. That's strange. Then they may ask to search some other things. And if they find your real phone, that's going to raise a couple more questions. Don't increase your attack surface. Don't give yourself another bullseye. Avoid the whole dummy phone and dummy computer thing. All right, inevitably I get asked about VPNs. This is probably the only really technical conversation I'm gonna get into here. A VPN is simple. It is a tunnel that encrypts data, that's all it does. A lot of people use that for privacy, it's not private, it's more for security than anything else. Commercial VPNs, stuff that your company would issue you, it gives you a tunnel where you can work in their network, in their corporate infrastructure. That's what a virtual private network is. You're virtually part of that private network. Off-the-shelf VPNs like NordVPN, Proton, all those, what they essentially do is give you a tunnel from your end user device to another server somewhere else that has a different IP address. Between your end user device and that server, you have some pretty good encryption. If I were trying to sniff packets in the air, I would just get a bunch of nonsense. But as soon as your traffic leaves this VPN server, it is you. It is ostensibly you. Everything you're doing, uh, all the sites you're going to, any other traffic, it's all out there. It can be de-anonymized, especially if you're logging into things using a username associated with you. The benefit of a VPN is that it changes your location. Your perceived location over the internet changes. That's the good thing about a VPN. So if I was in Somalia and I wanted to watch US Netflix, I VPN to a US server, I watch Netflix. But it doesn't mean that somebody in the US that sees my traffic wouldn't be able to attack me. They would just have a false impression of where I am. That's all a VPN does. It's a good security measure. It's good for defense and depth. It is not an end all be all. It won't protect you from malware, phishing, all the other bad things that are out there. I just want to make that clear because I get a lot of questions about will a VPN save me? It depends on who you're running away from, but probably not. So other questions about VPNs definitely hit me up offline. So let's cover what we went through in the very, very short time that I had. We have physical security aspects. 
no location means I can't find you. I think that that's relatively secure. You can't block all location, but you can try. Your online security, if you try to target you on social media, you'll find where your vulnerabilities are and you can mitigate that. Definitely OSINT yourself. For communication security, end-to-end -end encryption is what we got and it works. If all of you could reverse engineer the apps that you use, we'd be golden, but you can't. There's got to be some level of trust. But I would say if you're doing regular tel telephony, like your standard phone calls and your standard SMS, a lot less security than using something like WhatsApp, Signal, Wire, Session, anything like that. So consider end-to-end -end encryption for your communications. All right. Maybe I have time for questions. I think I have like, what, just a few minutes. If you want to reach out to me, please reach out to me. That QR code, uh, I'm, I'm looking at people that are clicking it. And I'm trying to make a note of like, did you really do your threat model with this? But it's okay. You can click it. It's fine. I'm not going to come after you. Um, those are some books and some websites that I recommend for further learning. But definitely reach out to me if you have any questions, because I am sorry. This is very short, but I hope you got something out of it. And thanks very much. And I think I have two minutes. I have two minutes if anyone has anything they want to ask. And please keep in mind, I lost my hearing in the war, so please speak up if you're going to ask anything. I don't see any brave souls. Yes, sir. Now, what is the worst thing that could happen if I scan that QR code? <laughs> you may be compelled to get an email from me if you email me because the email address is also in the QR code and then you'll have to have a conversation with me and I don't know how that's gonna go. That's, that's up to you, but you're a brave soul. All right. Please come find me. I'm probably going to be hanging out in Crypto Privacy Village if you want to have a chat. And once again, thank you very much for sitting through this.